Who's ready for some astronomy? Our first speaker today, you heard right after the Neutron Star merger happened. Was anybody here for that event? Yeah. Well, then all of you get to hear for the first time Dr. Jennifer Sobeck from the University of Washington join me in welcoming. crowd tonight, but I'd like to introduce you to a series of women astronomers, I'll kind of tell you why I'm going to do this. I'm going to tell you a little bit of background. There will be some derogatory kind of things they had to push through, but the important thing is that they did, and they made huge contributions to science. So today, I'm going to introduce you to the Harvard Computers, Women Who Map the Sky. Has anybody seen the movie Hidden Figures by chance? Yeah. Anybody watch the film? Figures the heart, the read the book in figures by chance. Yeah, it's a fantastic book. I definitely do recommend it if you get a chance. But as you can uh, kind of remember from that movie, basically all the women who performed math 
all of the women who performed uh, calculations were referred to as computers. So this is actually the first definition of computers. This is what people actually refer to. So not like our, our Macs or our PCs or anything like that, but it was actually people that we uh, refer to for computers. So I just wanted to say I have a special thanks to Rachel Baden, Oliver Frazier, who is with our department as well, and actually some people at Harvard who helped me out with this presentation, namely Warren Smith. So uh, there's a really great quote from Isaac Newton. It's, if I, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And basically this means that science is accomplished by standing on the shoulders of people who've gone before us, people who performed experiments. There's just no way to do this. And by the way, like just thinking about the Nobel Prize and stuff like that, these things are awarded to you know, a person or two or three people. Really, truly today, science is a group of people, and we're all standing on one another's shoulders. So what we me mean for this talk today is I was a brand new graduate student at the University of Texas, and I had been given a book I had been given a book by my advisor at the time, Chris Steven, a really fantastic fellow. He encouraged me and he really pushed me and helped me through graduate school. Anyway, I was given this book and it said CM Moore. And I was like, oh great, I'll take a look through it. I'm sure his work is really, really good. And he was like, no, it's not a him, it's a her. And my eyes just went, Shh. I was just so happy. Because I have to admit, up until that time, besides Murray Curie, I hadn't really heard of that many women astronomers. I hadn't really heard of that many um, you know, women physicists. So it really made a difference to see this and understand this. And so this is Charlotte Moore Siddeley. She was a Princeton computer. She did a multitude of things, but she really just was known for this very precise wavelength and multiplet tables. Multiplet is a little bit of astrophysics. But she is the one that kind of motivated me to go further, to go deeper, and see you know, what other computers were doing. And I think it's really important for us to know that, you know, hey, you know, in science, we're still on the shores of many people, but who were these people? And were some people kind of left out of history and not mentioned? And it turns out there, there were a few. So here are the Harvard computers. Basically, in the 1860s and 1870s, the Harvard Observatory was really pretty well established at this time. They were, had a, you know, were developing a bunch of facilities, both in North America and in South America, so in the northern and southern hemispheres. And they were starting to really collect a lot of data. And so um, during the 1860s and 1870s, women could volunteer, such as um, Eliza Quincy, but they were never given full um, status at Harvard. So they spent their time, they worked hard, and they tried to volunteer as student assistants. Around 1875, they find, Harvard finally says, you know what, we're going to pay these women staff. We're going to at least you know, employ women on a regular basis, and we're going to kind of set up a, a staffing type of program. And so some of the very first computers that we've heard of, and they, they weren't quite given that term just yet, but are R.T. Rogers, R.G. Saunders, and Anna Wilmack. And they were just working on you know, a few uh, basic projects pretty much under the uh, supervision of the Harvard Observatory uh, um, chief. In 1876, there was a change in the directorship of Harvard Observatory. And it was a man by the name of Edward Charles Pickering. And he was ahead of his time. Boy, he he supported people, he supported women, and he actually said, hey, you know what, we're going to we're going to appoint women officially, we're going to name them computers, we're going to give them a title that at the time is definitely not as respectable. And he remained at Harvard College Observatory for the next 40 years. So you can kind of see, here are all the women. Oops. There we go. Uh, uh, just uh, working hard and assiduously, you notice how clean the room is, so forth and so on. But the funny thing is, is that there were no lab notebooks, and actually these lab notebooks are pretty much the same today. So they were using these to, to kind of catalog uh, the various observations. So this um, Pickering really does continue this uh, program, and he actually builds it. So he starts to hire more and more women observers. And in fact, it's his opinion that women do a better job than men. He says they're more meticulous, they're more precise, and they have tiny fingers that can do the work. <laughs> so we don't need that on him. So uh, anyway, uh, but the women observers, or sorry, the women computers, pardon me, were a bit of a bargain, as you can see. They are paid 25 to 30 cents uh, per hour. Their average male colleagues were placed, placed at least yeah. paid like 80 cents or a dollar per hour, so there was a bit of a wage gap. And they work roughly about six days a week. Just to give you an idea, these women who are working uh, for Harvard, they're being employed as staff. They've actually probably received a few of them degrees at this point, but this is before Radcliffe even opened. So in 1879, Radcliffe opened as a university. And there was the women's section, or the women's college of Harvard. 
1882, Pickering really picks up the pace. It's really becoming a huge scientific endeavor from Harvard Observatory. And he begins these photographic stellar investigations. And he starts creating the plate collection. That's something we're really going to focus on today. So these plates are basically either images or spectra of astronomical objects, things that we're very, very interested in. And then finally, the last person, besides Pickering, to really get this program in the room is a woman by the name of Anna Draper. Her husband, Dr. Draper, they actually had an observatory, their own personal observatory. This is still kind of in the era where you could be a quote unquote gentle woman observer or a gentle <laughs> man observer. But basically, you're funding your own science, you're funding your own observatories. So her husband, unfortunately, passes away, but he's doing this huge stellar catalog, just going star by star by star, looking throughout the sky, trying to give them identifications, trying to map the sky. He passes away during this time, and then she she issues a call. She said, hey, please help me finish this catalog, this work my husband's. Nobody answers it. So she goes up to um, Pickering and she says, hey, can you help me do this? They form a collaboration. She gives them uh, you know, instrumentation. She gives them money. And from this, the actual whole observer, or sorry, computer core is actually formed. So we're very, very thankful. By the way, just to let you know, Harvard College finally admitted women students in 1977. <laughs> All right, so what are these plates? What do they look like? And what do these computers actually have to do with, right? And so um, so basically, Harvard College Observatory houses one of the largest collections, if not the largest collection in the world of plates. They're like flash emulsion plates, right? So we're not quite at film, but we're basically um, using like a photographic emulsion to develop you know, images or spectra of astronomical um, objects that we're interested in. And so you can kind of see here on the left, here's an actual spectrum. And uh, if you're a little familiar with your physics slash astronomy, this is H beta, which is basically a spectral line of hydrogen. This is H alpha right here. And this is what they're working with star by star by star and looking at these identifications. So you can see this particular plate, there's lots of spectra. And each of these actually represents a, a, a stellar spectrum of a, of a cluster. So basically, this is a collection of stars. So they're spending all their time getting really deep into this, and they're looking at each one of these spectra. And this is the tool that they use to do this. It's called a fly swatter. But basically, they're sitting there with magnification, magnification glasses. They're putting them up to their eyes, and they're just marking feature by feature what they, what they believe for each of these stars. So it's really, really interesting. As you can tell, there's about, or sorry, as I mentioned here, there's about 20 Harvard telescopes, so there's all of these um, telescopes are collecting data in the US, Peru, South Africa. And then um, basically this program of computers um, analyzed about 450,000 plates, roughly um, 100,000 plates of spectra. So we're talking over half a million plates that these women were able to accomplish over the period from 1890 to 1940, so 50 years. It's a really remarkable achievement. So, our first woman, and I forgot to tell you, I'm wearing a t-shirt, and it features the computers, actually. So, who's seen uh, the NASA LEGO Women's set? I'm so proud that that has actually been released. It's something that I definitely participated in with my fellow colleagues in getting this released. Well, there's LEGOs now of all sorts of the astronomers collect the series. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, so I have a LEGO Women's set. Uh, a strong shirt, and it's featuring some of the computers that I'll talk about now. So the first of these is Henrietta Swan Leavitt. She was really one of the initial computers, so she had that full computer title at uh, Harvard Observatory. She um, was very much interested in variable stars, and so what I featured here is just a really nice nearby variable star. In fact, it turns out to be a Cepheid. I'll talk a little bit more about that more in just a second. And here's one of her actual plates. And if you can't see it too much, but if you zoom in, you can actually see the identifications that she made on this particular plate. So she had graduated from Radcliffe, and she started volunteering. And of course, they didn't care of anyway, but eventually she got a computer title. Her thing was classification. So she's looking at the spectra, and she's going through, and she's classifying all the lines of the spectrum. Uh, she was basically looking at these things from superposition. So you had one plate, and then another plate taken just a little time later, and she superimposed the two to really understand that there was variability in the stars, meaning if the positions of the lines shifted back and forth. She discovered roughly 2,400 variable stars, half of all known variable stars at that period of time. She was prolific. 
So in 1908, she publishes a catalog of roughly 2,000 variable stars that had been identified in the large and small Magellanic clouds. Anybody familiar with the Magellanic clouds? Okay. <laughs> but basically, these are satellite galaxies of the Milky Way, and one of the reasons we're probably not familiar with them is because you can see them from the southern hemisphere. So when you get a chance, when you're down in Peru or Chile or Brazil, look up into the night sky, and you will probably see future the small and large Magellanic clouds. Anyway, these images were more sensitive than any images she had previously made, and then she, these was really started to be something of a, a pioneering discovery. So here is her plate. It was taken with a small Magellanic cloud, and at this point, she's actually able to publish and publish under her own name. This is something pretty, pretty special. And so she does again issue a, a publication, like I mentioned, and she starts to talk about these faint variable stars. And then um, what she mentions in particular, a really nice um, kind of finding that she arrives at, is that taken within two to three days of each other, so plates taken within two to three days of each other, have equally interesting results, showing that the periods of many variables are indeed short. So she's, she's just found something a little bit special, and she knows it. She knows that she's discovered something really, really special. And what she discovered is something called sepiates. And sepiates have a really well-established luminosity period relationship. So understanding their brightness, the luminosity, as a function of um, their periods, which is basically a period is thinking about you know, how fast the star is fluctuating or how fast it's varying. And so this is her original plot. And so what you can see here on the y-axis is luminosity. And it goes from faintest to brightest. And then on the x-axis right here is the period of time, so very short period fluctuations versus very long period fluctuations. And this is actually her plot right here. And so she gives this relationship, she publishes it, she establishes it, but it's pretty darn fundamental. And what she said is showing that there's a simple relation between the brightness of the variables and their periods. So that's actually a quote from her, from her publication. She went on to provide the first calibration of the slope of this relationship but as there was no known distance to the MCU, it was, you know, we knew it was out there, but we didn't know how to establish a distance. She wasn't actually really able to calibrate it. And just before uh, she was able to get this information, she actually passed away. So, we have Evan, uh, Edwin Hubble here. Uh, people, of course, are familiar with the Hubble Space Telescope. The next generation, which is going to be the James Webb Space Telescope. But Hubble is still definitely operating at this point. And Hubble pretty much stood on the shoulders of Henrietta Leavitt, but we didn't know it. So Hubble went in and he um, examined, you know, uh, various sepiates, so these, these really well un understood varying stars, right? And he examined them in the small Magellanic cloud. And as you can see right here, here's an image, an actual image from Carnegie Observatories at the Magellanic cloud. And he was able to sit there and look at the sepiates, especially in the Magellanic cloud and um, in Andromeda. And he was able to establish, um, using this periodic uh, luminosity relationship, that it was a galaxy way external to the Milky Way. So first, we didn't understand, you know, if it was just something like some sort of satellite or if it was indeed its own external galaxy. He continued this idea, and eventually he was able to measure the local rate of expansion of the universe. This is a fundamental finding. It's called the Hubble constant. And it's something that today we investigate, and we actually try to hone down and understand because it's related to the expansion of the universe. For a hundred years, Hubble used, um, you know, for a hundred years, Hubble was actually credited with this lighting. He was credited with this period of luminosity relationship, and then Henry and Ellie lived completely left out. So now we have Annie Jump Cannon. Annie Jump Cannon is uh, one of my favorites. She's a spectroscopist, full, a full fledged spectroscopist, studying normal stars. She was um, pretty much um, worked for a, a long period in Harvard. And what I've kind of shown here is just her working at a desk. She's one of these women that made the transition from being a computer to almost being like a staff astronomer. I've shown here in the middle, Spectra. And of course, it goes from Roy G. Biv. Anybody know what Roy G. Biv stands for? <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, uh, you've, got, you've got enough questions for tonight. I'll, I'll ask you later. But anyway, it's um, Spectra of all the stars of Pyades, which is an open cluster in the disk of our galaxy. And this is an actual notebook from uh, Henrietta that is currently stored at, Har at Harvard. So she begins volunteering at the observatory, where she's taking grad classes at Radcliffe. She's actually deaf. 
So um, she's doing this work, she's accomplishing this in, in all the you know, time you're hearing impaired, so it's, it's very impressive. Pickering is completely overwhelmed and just impressed by her work, and he starts to promote her. And as you can see, in 1911, she kind of goes to a second curator of the astronomical photographs. But at the time, the president of Harvard University did not want to allow her to be listed as staff. So you won't find her name in the staff directory at Harvard. Eventually, she moves beyond this, and in 1938, she's finally recognized. So we are 27 years later. <laughs> she's finally recognized as Harvard staff. And she becomes the official curator of astronomical of photographs. She averaged three stars a minute. <laughs> she averaged three stars a minute, and she was able to classify over a quarter of a million stars during her career. That's just phenomenal. I, I can't do that. <laughs> so she was completely impressive. She um, basically uh, did retire. Of, oops, sorry, I guess those dates are a little bit wrong there. She did retire eventually, and her position was left open because they couldn't find anybody to actually fulfill um, her position with that level of just proficiency and expediency. So Canon is really nice because, of course, she started this um, spectral classification and the understanding of the whole stellar sequence. So I'm looking at stars, and I realize that they have characteristics and properties, but how do I begin to understand this? How do I begin to type these stars and try to group them in and make sense of what I'm seeing. So she was able to uh, refine the classification systems of Fung and Bari. She reduced the number of categories and made it really straightforward to understand, hey, this star is here, it belongs to this type, it has this temperature, so forth and so on. And so there's this, if you've ever taken an Astro 101 class, there is an acronym that we use to help people understand the stellar classification system, and it's O-B-A-F-G-K-M. Anybody knows what the traditional acronym stands for? Oh, be the fine girl and kiss me tonight. <laughs> There's that. That is not my favorite acronym. So in my own astro classes, I've asked for people to come up with ideas, substitute acronyms. Uh, I took these from a class at Stony Brook, but old, bald, and fat generals keep mistresses. <laughs> oh boy, and F grade kills me. And only boring astronomers find gratitude knowing mnemonics. <laughs> <laughs> so she's done this classification system. It was a huge step forward. And kind of um, what I've shown here in the middle plot is just um, a prism spectra. So this is what was the first time that we were able to break apart light into a spectrum. We used a prism. So something that, you know, I think we're kind of all familiar with. And here's the actual stellar spectra sequence. This is for main sequence stars, so basically meaning stars that are in the prime of their lifetimes. And you can see here it goes from the hottest temperature down to the lowest. And there's actually a change in what you can see with the spectrum. I'll show you more in just a second. And she had a little grade of finer distinction. Anyway, she has a really nice quote. She says, each spectrum is a gateway to a wonderful new world. And so here is her um, stellar classification system. And this is, of course, a modern-day version of this where you can see O stars at the top and M stars at the bottom. O stars have a surface temperature of 44,000 Kelvin, roughly. M stars are pretty cool at 32 to 40. Our own sun is a G star, and our own sun has a temperature of roughly 1,500 Kelvin, just to give you an idea. So Canon's system was so stable, so robust, that it was adopted by the IAU, and today it's known, of course, as the Harvard Spectral Classification System, not the Canon. The so there's one other woman who I found really, really fascinating, and her name is Cecilia Payne the Washington. Cecilia Payne. <laughs> Sorry, no, I don't want to butcher that. But anyway, she is just phenomenal, and uh, she really, uh, out of all of these uh, computers, she's the one to achieve the most and the greatest transition in her career. So she uh, was around for Harvard pretty much primarily during the 20th century. And she tried to initially study at Cambridge the paper to her. We don't accept women. So she went to Harvard at the time. People found her to be so fascinating, so intelligent, that they actually allowed her, they created a special degree category for her. And she's the first person to graduate from Radcliffe with a PhD. So she was that impressive. In, it took her about 30 years, though, so she gets the PhD, she goes to work for Harvard Observatories, it takes her about 30 years, and finally they give her a professorship. Just to know, let you guys know today, the average time for most professors transitioning from like a postdoc, so kind of a period after the PhD, 
The professorship is seven years. It took her 30. And eventually, she became the first woman to head the department at Harvard. So she was a third department head, but the first one to do so, and she's just amazing. So what I'm showing you here is a view of the sun, because this is one of her primary research topics, and I just love this view of the sun. This is from NASA, and what it is is a compilation of both ground-based and space-based images of our sun at different wavelengths. So each wavelength gives you a piece of information, and this picture clearly shows that, and it gives you a different view of the sun. You get an idea as to activity, you get an idea as to contact, and this is just a really beautiful view of the sun. And these are her notes. And one of the things she worked on is line streaks and identifications. And so here, this is her at the telescope right here. She's taking data for her doctoral work at that point. And then um, what she discovered at the time is that the sun is made primarily of hydrogen and helium. And only 2% of the sun is heavy elements. So it's basically hydrogen, helium, and heavy elements. And this shocked people. Because people thought, hey, the sun and the earth they should be the same. They should have the same composition. But she was the one to prove it. She saw a connection also between atomic physics and the understanding of these lines that we see in the absorption spectrum. She was really able to make that connection. And she was under able to understand this as a function of the layers of the sun. Understand what was going on atomic physics wise in the layers of the sun. She was able to show that the many differences of lines in the solar spectrum were due to different atomic ionization states. Sorry, that's a lot of physics coming at you guys. We haven't had enough here for that much physics, I don't think. And that basically different temperatures, um, it was related to different temperatures and different amounts of the elements. So here is an actual spectrum of our sun. And I want you to be impressed because each of these dark spaces right here, so basically it's a black body spectrum, YG blue, the rainbow. And so there's a background of rainbow that comes from our sun. And essentially, each of the dark places right here is where some sort of element has taken out light from that background of rainbow. And each of these dark spaces, you know, corresponds to a different element. So that's how we're able to understand, hey, what's in our sun? Not just what's in our sun, but what's in stars all throughout our galaxy. She was, her work was totally pioneering. And of course, I've given this nice little periodic table of the elements, something I referred to in my last talk. But basically showing that you know all these things in this periodic table of elements are actually kind of representing this one segment of the solar spectrum. So this her finding was so revolutionary that Henry Norris Russell said, "No, I don't believe you. Nope, I don't got that." And so he went down. He uh, was actually at Princeton too, so I won't lie. A little bit of the Harvard Princeton dynamic came in there. He took his own observations. He said, "Ah, yes, this finding is true." He published it, and actually he was credited with the finding for several, several uh, decades afterwards. So, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I want to point you to two references tonight, and I really want to highlight that these women, you know, succeeded through kind of adverse and tough times, but they really did persevere. And the thing is, is that even though history did forget them at times that their work still came through. And I'm so grateful to know that because they're an inspiration to me. And so um, what Harvard has done is actually started to invest in these computers, these women that gave 50 years of time, right, to figure out the astronomical science and really truly making you know, the work move forward. And so one of these is called Project Favor, which is preserving Harvard's early data and research astronomy. And one of the reasons I'm pointing out to you is, I know everybody has a ton of abundant time, but I really believe in citizen science. And this is one of the ways that you can contribute. So you can go to Project Fader's webpage, and what you can do is perform transcription of the, um, their notebooks and their images. So you're actually helping science and, and archiving to move forward for these women. So as you can see right here, here's the Project Fader, um, Fader results for Annie John Cannon, Cecilia Payne, and then Henrietta Swan Newman. And so by the way, Henrietta, you need some help here. But if you do get a chance, even just taking a look at their notes is absolutely fascinating and realizing what they understood over 100 years ago. It's just amazing. And so I gave a few just links down here in case you want to know. And by the way, these women were so prolific that all the computers combined generated 2,400 notebooks. The other really cool thing, and this I think people will relate to too, is big data. So the funny thing is, for a long time we had these photographic plates. And roughly in about the 80s, 90s, we transitioned to CCDs. So basically, like your iPhone, all these cameras, they work off the CCDs. 
So we had these plates, and they were in storage for forever, collecting dust. And we finally realized that, hey, there might be some information on them. And the way that we really understood that these plates were valuable is they actually found an old photographic plate from about 70 years ago where the first exoplanet was actually imaged. So it was really, it was really quite fascinating. So what they did is they built a device. They said, hey, we're going to load, upload all these devices into a scanner. We're going to collect the information from the scanner, as you can see here. And then we're going to make all of this available to scientists. Oops. We're going to make all of this available to scientists. And so essentially all of this data that was taken roughly years ago is being used now in current research. So it's really, really fascinating. And I just want to point out too that, you know, I've talked tonight about 3 women. There were so many more computers. And by the way, there were so many more computers throughout, um, you know, various institutions and various laboratories. And so right here, this is the rocket women. So again, kind of, um, you know, thinking about that community of your city, these are also women who worked on uh, various um, programs that NASA had established. Here's an image of them right here. There's a wonderful book that goes with the rocket women, and I highly suggest that you'll take it out. It'll probably be like a, a good movie too at some point. So I just want to end this really quickly. I think I did really quick, but I doubt it. Anyway, but um, with a quote from Jedediah Isler, she's a fantastic astrophysicist, and she's a, whoops, whoops. She's a great advocate for STEM. And one of the things that she says is, so if we want to get to know our best possible discoveries, we want to get to these best possible discoveries, then everyone has to have a seat at the table. So my presentation tonight is just a tip of the iceberg, and I hope I can encourage you to look into this and kind of see who were the people that really made our scientific discoveries. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions. Like, where did I get this awesome shirt? <laughs> yeah. Does it come in men's sizes? Yes, it does. <laughs> yeah. So I have a question. So a lot of the women you mentioned were women who were initials. They used their initials and not their full names. Is that a trend that you see with women at that time to maybe bring more credibility? Good question. So um, basically, um, the, um, she asked whether or not um, what we see when you see a lot of publications, when you see a lot of mentions of these women, um, you see initials as opposed to their names. And so I will tell you that we do, I refer to myself as you know, Jay Sobek, right? But I will tell you that's a little bit of a dodge. You're right. Uh, just to kind of maybe not affiliate gender initially and to maybe push through just those first stages, yeah, they definitely refer to themselves by their initials. I also have to tell you guys, uh, I hope it's not too negative. I hope you drink enough beer to feel positive about this stuff. <laughs> but, ready? So I'm looking for images for these guys. And I, I mean, it's just fascinating. And I'm so thankful, because by the way, this presentation stands on the shoulders of so many people. But this particular image is known as the paper doll image. Every, a lot of images that I found of them, they were known as Pickering's harem. So if you search for them, one of the very first search terms that you'll come up with Carol, or a bunch of women who are doing absolutely phenomenal work. Any other questions? Yeah. What is the recognized definition of an exoplanet? <laughs> <laughs> nice try. So, yes, what is the ne definition of an exoplanet? I know the answer. <laughs> but no one comes to my promise. Actually, it's going to come in a few minutes because there's a break between me and the next speaker, who's, by the way, absolutely fabulous. She's written a book. I highly encourage you to say. I highly encourage you to have another beer. But um, are there any other questions? Yeah. This is a really good question. So basically, do, do the plates uh, degrade over time? And the answer is yes for some of them. They tried a whole variety of different emulsions, so basically different chemistry to get the you know to get the plates. Also, they tried chemistry, which is really kind of interesting to see which um, emulsions were more sensitive to red light versus which emulsions were more sensitive to blue light. And then again, is giving you a little bit of piece of information when you're looking at a star or when you're looking at a nebula. And so yeah, unfortunately, some of them, because of the different uses of emulsion, did degrade. And then actually, some of them were trashed. In fact, I know my department trashed a bunch of their photographic plates, unfortunately. Short time. Anything else? Yeah. 
So basically, I had mentioned that um, they found out that one of the very first exoplanets had actually been seen in a photographic plate. So yeah, there's a study on it, especially thankfully to this um, the DASH project, the one that I mentioned, the digitizing of all these Harvard images. Yeah, there's, there's Mad Dash to see it again, just based on current spectra, if we go back and see, hey, was this perhaps seen maybe six years ago, maybe eight years ago. So yeah, they're, they're definitely trying to call that up. Uh, the question is, have I gone to any public high school to get these socks? Not yet. Um, I, I think I'd like to uh, very much. Um, I'm involved in a mentorship program because, you know, I, I, I had somebody mentor me, actually, so I want to kind of repay that. And so I'm involved in one mentorship program right now. Um, I'd like to get involved in more, so maybe it's just an opportunity. And I'll, I'll make this talk really home and really find out. All right. Hey guys, I hope you have a wonderful Friday night. I'm so glad that you came out, and I hope you keep on coming out to our Astro sometime. Thank you. We're going to take a few minute break. Everyone can use the restroom and get more beer, and then we're going to give you trivia results. So come on back in the next 10 minutes. See you soon.
tell us whether or not we have discovered the second Earth or not. Yes or no? Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth. So, I know you have a few regrets about tonight, because I too had a Women in Astronomy Lego t shirt, which I always wore, but then I was like, it's cold. <laughs> so, I guess my regrets are 50 50, because I was right about that second part. So, have we found Earth 2.0? I'm going to start our story with what I hope is a relatively familiar system of planets. This one. So, on the far left, we have our nearest star, the Sun. And then moving outwards, we have our rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. And just in case anyone has had a few too many beers, you are here. <laughs> And then beyond that, we have our gas giants, which are predominantly atmosphere and kind of masses. So Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And then some of you might be saying, Pluto? <laughs> and what we say to you is that we don't talk about Pluto. <laughs> However, our sun is not the only star with planets around it. Now, our story begins in the early 1990s when we found the first planet around a pulsar, which you all know from doing your quiz earlier. So these were two planets initially discovered around a pulsar in the early 1990s, and everyone ignored them. Probably because a pulsar is a freaky dead star, and people were like, yeah, too weird. <laughs> discovered over three and a half thousand exoplanets. I believe the count was this morning 3,605. Uh, and roughly one third of those are approximately Earth-sized, by which I mean their physical radius is less than twice ours. So, this has led to an obvious question. Could any of these Earth-sized worlds actually be Earth-like? Well, Let's do the obvious thing and check the news. <laughs> so we have headlines like Earth 2.0. NASA says scientists have found the closest twin outside the solar system. Or we have NASA's discovery of a solar system with seven, seven Earth-like planets will change how we hunt for alien life. Or we have Earth-like planets around Proxima Centauri discovered. That's our nearest star. So nearest star must be just like us, right? So, Oh yes, and then spotted our alien neighbors. <laughs> NASA finds a group of Earth-like planets that could host alien life using Kepler. So based on this, I would say, well, I mean, there's just Earths everywhere, how? <laughs> <laughs> but I have to tell you, we're about to do a bit of ice bucketing. So let's wait a minute and do something rather controversial and ask what we know about these planets. So, 96% of planets, so basically all of them, are found using one of two techniques. The first technique we call the radial velocity, or sometimes the Doppler wobble, because it sounds cooler. <laughs> so this involves the star making a bit of a wobble because of the planet's gravity. So we normally think of the planet going around the star, and that fortunately is true. But the star also responds to the planet's gravitational pull, and it makes a teensy bit of a wobble. And as it does, it wobbles towards the Earth and further away. And that causes its light waves to get stretched and compressed. So we see a red and blue shift in the light, and that indicates the planet. The second one is a little bit more intuitive. The planet simply passes between us and the star and blocks out a bit of the starlight. And we call this the transit technique. So what do these methods tell us? Well, the Doppler wobble tells us the planet's minimum mass. The reason it's the minimum is we do not know the orientation of that orbit. If it is exactly edge on, bam, we get the mass. If, however, that orbit is tilted, we underestimate the mass because only part of the star's wobble is in our direction. And we have no way of knowing from this technique alone what the orientation of that orbit is. Transit gives us the planet radius. Not the minimum radius, it does give us the legit radius. 
And there's no small print to that one. So this means that typically for any exoplanet discovery, we know a sum total of two things. <laughs> we know either something about the planet's extent, so either its radius or its minimum mass. And we know something about how far it is from the star, so we know how much radiation, how much starlight that planet is receiving. And the problem is, neither of those actually directly relate to what's going on on the surface. So, why then do we get the following news announcements? <laughs> In 2014, a planet with the very catchy moniker GJ832C was discovered. And this has a minimum mass, because it was found through that radial velocity technique, of five times that of the Earth. So it was a super-Earth. However, when the research paper came out, see how professional that looks, <laughs> the abstract says the following. Now note, I'm not even going to bother reading the paper. I am looking at that top abstract section, the introduction, the bit that really everyone reads. And it says the following. Given the large mass of the planet, it likely would possess a massive atmosphere. And therefore, GJ832C is more likely to be a super Venus, because Venus has colossal atmospheres. Surface temperature of Venus, anyone? <laughs> yeah, it is 460 Celsius, and I don't even need to translate that into Fahrenheit, because it's really irrelevant at this stage. <laughs> So, longest spacecraft has ever survived on the Venetian surface. Any bets? Well, it's a bit better than your guesses, but really it makes very little difference. It's about two hours. So this is Venera 13, and that temperature is hot enough to melt lead. So that spacecraft didn't survive all that long. So, likely to be Earth 2.0? I think we're going to go with a no, 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 no. But the press had other opinions. So we got newfound alien planet, Gliese, that's DJ. A32C may be able to support life. You know, by exoplanet, is the best candidate for supporting life. I'm guessing whoever wrote that lives in Arizona in the summer. Oh, no. Gliese 832c, potentially habitable super-Earth discovered a mere 16 light years away. <laughs> or maybe this potentially habitable uh, super-Earth is just 16 light years away. <laughs> so, you know, really, we should be packing our bags right now. It's clearly around the corner and it's a beach holiday. <laughs> so where the hell did this happen? I mean, I didn't even read the paper here. I just read the abstract. So how do we go from... Are you going to read any part of the paper? It's going to be the abstract. So how did we go so horribly wrong? And the answer, or at least part of the answer, is something called metrics. And we hate them. <laughs> so what metric? I think most people would have heard of. This first metric I'm going to introduce is the so-called habitable zone. So the habitable zone the official definition is where an Earth-like planet can maintain liquid water on its surface. So the edges are, if you take our planet and you shove it outwards, there comes a point where all our water freezes and we become a snowball. That is the outer edge of the habitable zone. Conversely, if you grab the Earth and give it a really big shove inwards, there's a point where all our water evaporates and that is the inner edge of the habitable zone. However, like all real estate contracts, there is small print. And the small print in this one, oh, sorry, it's a binary, you're either in or out, whatever. Um, the small print in this one is Earth-like. So just because you're inside the habitable zone doesn't mean you are an Earth-like planet. Indeed, of all the planets we found in the habitable zone around their stars, there are five times as many planets that are very likely to be gas giants like Jupiter that have any kind of solid surface. So a different planet may or may not be able to maintain water in the same location. So for our Glaze A32C, it sits just on the inner edge of a habitable zone. So the question is, is it Earth-like enough? Like, is it an Earth clone so we can use this habitable zone contract? Well, I mean, we just said it had five times our mass, so I'm thinking no. <laughs> 
Like, it's obviously not identical to us, so therefore we can't apply the habitable zone. Therefore, we're not really talking about liquid water, and did I mention it's super Venus? I am. No. So, the second problem we had was with a second metric that has mercifully fallen out of use. I like to think because I keep giving this talk. Uh, <laughs> and that was called something called the Earth Similarity Index. And it looks like this. which looks very professional. <laughs> However, we can break it down and say all this equation is saying is you take the planet's property and you subtract from it the same property of the Earth. And you throw in some arbitrary weighting, and you multiply these all together. <laughs> and the properties we consider are density, radius, escape velocity, and surface temperature. Problem number one. None of these four conditions actually measure surface conditions at all. And we're missing like loads of important factors that are going to control what it's like on the surface. For example, the fact that we have plate tectonics is kind of a big deal. Our uh, volcanoes actually produced our atmosphere, if you care about that. Um, <laughs> the fact that we have a nice circular orbit without extreme uh, you know, seasons, I mean, again, that might be nice. Uh, our magnetic field prevents our atmosphere from being stripped by the sun. Our rock type helps the amount of greenhouse gases in our air. And the fact we actually have water does help us in supporting it. So, you know, small points, but none of those are at all mentioned in these four properties. <laughs> so it becomes a little bit like this Facebook game. Which of your friends do you most look like? So this is the same basic idea. They take properties of your photo, they take the same properties of your friend's photo, they subtract them and they look for the smallest difference. So, this is me. Which of my friends do you think I most look like? Let's have a drum roll for that. <laughs> so the answer turned out to be this bag of chips. <laughs> <laughs> so for reasons better known to himself, my buddy Will decided to replace his profile picture with a bag of frazzles, which are rather good chips, I have to say. And this Facebook game was like, hell yeah, you're twins. <laughs> that either we haven't got enough comparison points between me and this bag of frazzles, or possibly we're using the wrong ones. <laughs> Which brings me to this four list again. The second problem is, did I mention we can only observe two things, and none of them are actually these. <laughs> so we can observe either the radius or the minimum mass. Or we can observe the amount of radiation the planet is getting. Aha! You might think you lied, because look, surface temperature, that must be correlated with the amount of radiation the planet is getting. And yet, it's not. So, we've got four quantities based on two measurements, and neither of them are those four quantities. So, for example, the equilibrium temperature here is what you get from the amount of radiation. It is the temperature at the top of the atmosphere. So the equilibrium temperature for our planet is a rather chilly minus 18 Celsius, whereas our actual global average is 15 Celsius. So minus 18, the point is everything's frozen. 15, I think we're talking about, I don't know, what is that in Fahrenheit? Like, you need a coat. <laughs> 16s, maybe. And as I mentioned, Venus is hot, but its equilibrium temperature is about late 80s which, you know, seems like a beach holiday. <laughs> but again, its surface temperature is something that melts lead, so no, not really. So the atmosphere has a very strong effect in what happens to that radiation when it reaches us. And it's not like a linear effect. You can't just add 33 and call it a done deal. That only works for the Earth, and it most suddenly doesn't work for Venus. So we have these two measurements. And... Oh yeah, right, sorry. So yes, this planet that we're looking at here, this has only two. So it has the minimum mass and it has the amount of radiation. And what happened was these two were used to make a guess at these four. And then what the result was a value 0.81 out of one. And the claim was, well, if you're above 0.8, you're Earth-like. <laughs> so we took two properties, none of which measure surface conditions. We used them to derive four other properties that we can't measure. And we ended up with a value that claims were identical to Earth and everyone believed it. <laughs> so just in case you weren't convinced, 
What do we think the ESI of Venus would be? If we observe Venus as an exoplanet, as a clue, Venus is very similar in size to the Earth. So out of one, who thinks it's 0.5 or above? Who thinks it's 0.8 or above? Who thinks it's 0.9 or above? Yeah, the last group is perfect. It is 0.9. <laughs> so yeah, Venus, super habitable, identical to the Earth. And any volunteers who goes there next week? <laughs> so, yeah, make sure we hate them. Um, so, what can we do? Well, we can't yet measure what it's like on these planet's surfaces. So, we can't yet tell if we really have found Earth 2.0. All we can do is say something is Earth-sized. We can't yet say whether it's at all Earth-like. But have patience, my young Padawans, because their help is at hand. So currently, we do know of Earth-sized planets, but we don't know about Earth-like. But our next generation of telescopes is going to change that. These guys are going to be looking at the planet atmosphere. And when they do, if they manage to decipher the composition of the atmosphere, we will get our first glimpse of something that is on the surface. So JWST flies in 2019, Ariel is the European Space Agency's mission flying in 2026, I think. And Twinkle is a little UK mission that they're hoping to get up sooner rather than later. Um, but all of these are aimed at looking at atmospheres, and these may be able to tell us what is going on on the surface and may even give us the first sniff of life on another planet. And maybe, maybe, then we'll be able to talk seriously about Earth 2.0. So my final slide is a shameless plug. Um, <laughs> I wrote an exoplanet book, and if I haven't demonstrated how many wonderful ways there are to die horrifyingly on these planets in this talk, I mean, I have a lot more options for you guys. So there are hot Jupiters, which are planets the size of our largest gas giant on orbits that last four Earth days. We have Tatooine worlds with two suns, rogue planets with no star at all, planets with seas of lava or tar. All of them are horrifying, and they're all in this book. So I have today with me four copies, which I will happily part with for $25 each. Um, however, I also have a bajillion little cards that you can take as a memorabilia to this talk because they only come in packs of six million, so please do <laughs> come uh, And also, uh, this book is at most bookshops, it's on Amazon. It's also specifically stopped at Ada's at Capitol Hill because I'm giving a talk there tomorrow night and they promise they'll get the book in. So, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> as an exoplanet. And what people do is they sort of rewind the clock and say, based on what we knew about Earth's development of life, what would an early Earth look like if you could see its atmosphere? So often when we talk about the Earth, you hear the term pale blue dot. Or we might have like a pale orange dot because the hazes are from an early atmosphere. And that definitely is being considered, so we hope we could recognize an early Earth as well as a current Earth. I mean, I'd recommend my book. <laughs> so is there any academic literature I would recommend talking about early, early Earth atmospheres in particular, you mean, or just generally? Um, so, uh, let me think, off of my head I have to spell her name. Uh, there's a girl called Jada Arni, uh, who does a lot of work on this. Um, but I would check out conference proceedings, would be one hint I would get. So for instance, last November, 
there was a conference called Habitable Worlds in Wyoming, and uh, they have a few uh, things online. Uh, they were actually live streaming. I'm not sure whether the talks are still available, uh, but they also they definitely have some panel discussions that are available. And the scientists on that panel would be a great place to start looking up their papers because they're all studying habitable worlds. So you think that dark work effect you're finding planets, uh, what if there's multiple planets? Sorry, what if there's multiple planets? Multiple planets. Oh yes. Uh, so if we use Doppler effect to find planets, what if there's more than one planet in the system? Uh, actually you can distinguish that. So you fit the wobble to a periodic motion of a planet and you can actually unpick multiple orbits in that. So you want the wobble to appear periodically every time the planet laps. So you can tell if that time's changing slightly, you've more, more than likely got more and more planets in the system. And by matching the model to that, you can pick out the different planets. The four parameters that you mentioned that we're not able to discern, uh, what are some methods that might be able to detect those various components of exoplanets? So for some of them, we're a bit mystified. We don't know yet how to detect a magnetic field, for instance. But the presence of an atmosphere and detecting that composition is going to be really key. And the reason is that the planet's atmosphere is the result of pretty much everything that's going on in the planet. Like if it didn't have a magnetic field, we would expect that atmosphere to be stripped, for example. Uh, the geology, the volcanoes are going to be adding to that atmosphere. Life is going to be adding to that atmosphere. Really the whole planet system, the products of which we're going to be seeing in the gases in the air. So the challenge is not whether we will see what's going on, it's whether we will understand the fingerprints that we're going to get as a result of that. Anyone else? Yeah. Would you be able to determine if there was an atmosphere being produced at the surface, but escaping fast enough where the magnetic field wasn't present? So, the question is, could we tell if the atmosphere was theoretically being produced, but being simultaneously stripped? It all comes down to time scales, like how fast is stripping compared to the atmospheric production. Um, generally speaking, the atmosphere is outgassed from the planet fairly early on in its history. So you would expect either the atmosphere to be there and be about to be stripped, or be already lost. So you shouldn't get the situation where you miss it because it's been actively stripped, I think. These telescopes, you said you might actually be able to see the surface. If these telescopes in the future actually find life, what's, what's the astronomy community doing to, I don't know, is that be a huge announcement for the What would the astronomy group be doing to, I don't know, to formulate that message out of the Well, based on the media, we seem to be announcing it prematurely 10 years early. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I mean, I think there will be a lot of steps before we get to that stage. So one of the things we're going to see is this complex signature, I hope, of gases. Now the big question will be, is that definitely biological? Or can we do it abiologically? So for example, our atmosphere contains a lot of oxygen. Does that mean definitely life? On the Earth, absolutely, oxygen is definitely produced by life. But if you look at the atmosphere of some of the Jupiter's moons, like Europa, they have oxygen atmospheres, but they don't have life. So it is possible to be able to produce a lot of these would-be biosignatures by abiotic means. So I don't think there'll be nothing, 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 shabang, we found aliens. I think it will be, you know, this is the stage we're at, we're seeing some interesting signatures, what could this mean, what are the possibilities? So I hope we give everyone a very gentle build-up. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our next event is March 28th, back on a Wednesday. I hope to see you there. Thanks for coming out.